Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining our Synergy webinar series where we designed the next hour to share case studies using complementary techniques that examines one application from multiple angles. So our webinar today is titled Rapid Analytical Methods for Quality Control of Hemp Emulsions. With me are your speakers, Yana, the CEO of Blaze Science, um, Dr. Adam Gilmore, Aqualog Product Manager of Hariba Scientific, and Dr. Sean Travers, the Life Science Account Manager of Hariba Scientific. My name is Julie Chenuin, and I am your facilitator. Um, we'll have a Q&A session in the end and promptly move over to our first speaker, Yana. So Yana, whenever you're ready, Okay, Julie's already introduced us all and the title. Now, let me just make sure it goes. Okay, I'd like to start off with some definitions first because this is kind of important to understand where all these things fit as far as in the regulations. So, the first definition is food, and basically, articles used for food or drink for man or other animals, chewing gum, which I found intriguing as being a food and articles used for components of any such. That's the regulatory terms. Of course, we um, consume them for taste, aroma, and nutrition. From the government standpoint, they're generally, and hopefully ours as well, they're generally recognized as safe by definition. Regulations around foods are threefold. You have FISMA, which is kind of the most, the newcomer. It's the Food Safety Modernization Act, and that basically gave FDA more power over how food is grown, processed, and you know, just through the whole chains to make sure you know it's safe. Codex, um, that's part of the USP. It deals mainly with just labeling of foods. And we have the GMPs, which are just stand for good manufacturing practices. Next, we go to definition of a drug. And those are, as we know, articles intended to cure, diagnose, mitigate, treat, or prevent disease in man or animals. They affect the structure or function of the body, and they're listed in the official compendium, which basically for the U.S. is the U.S. pharmacopoeia. And you have monographs for each of these drugs, which have multiple tests in them that ensure that the product is the quality it's supposed to meet, you know, as a drug. Of course, they're generally, in, in this case, they're deemed unsafe by definition until the company that is manufacturing it does all the, the necessary research, um, clinical trials, et cetera, to show that it's safe, number one, and effective. The key regulations around these are the GMPs as well, for specifically for pharmaceuticals, which are gonna be similar, but more intense as far as some of the testing. And next we go to dietary supplements. So where do they fit in? Well, in 1974, um, DSHEA was passed, which is the Dietary Supplement Health and Educational Act. That classified the supplements into the food group. And so their definition there is any product, of course, other than tobacco that contains a vitamin, mineral, herb, botanical, et cetera, that's intended to supplement the diet. You don't need for dietary supplements, kind of the scary point here for me has always been, you don't need to prove it's safe before selling it and you don't need to prove it's effective, which is one of the key reasons a lot of these things don't do what the literature states, you know, when you look at scientific literature. Um, the regulations are what are called the CGMPs, and the C just stands for current good manufacturing practices. It's kind of a, an evolving process. So where does cannabis now fit in? It's the newcomer here. Well, first of all, They've defined cannabis, both hemp and marijuana are the exact same species. They're only separated by legal jargon, which means they're separated by how much THC the product has. If it's equal to or less than 0.3% THC, the plant is classified or the product is classified as a hemp product. Anything over that then becomes marijuana, which still in all states is um, federally illegal. In many states, it's a recreational drug, which is kind of like confusing to me always how that can be, you know, statewide legal, federally illegal, but of course the feds don't come in after you in the states that are legal. 
Medicinal use also has been approved, but not on the federal level yet. Canada, they're so way ahead of us, is the only exception. They've legalized it throughout the country. So hemp, well, hemp has been in the industry for a while, legal as far as the seeds and fiber are concerned. They've, they're considered grass, which means generally recognized as safe. Um, you see them in the um, health food stores, you know, hemp seed, hemp hearts, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's been fine, but it's been the flower that typically until the farm bill was passed in 2018, I believe, was the first um, that they differentiated hemp was considered, um, the flower was considered a schedule one as, as marijuana, which was kind of silly because hemp was not psychoactive like that. So they defined it in the farm bill as anything, again, is less than or equal to 0.3% THC. CBD has been the big one of the cannabinoids that has been marketed the most. Now it's starting to CBN, CBG, but CBD has been the crux of everything. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, CBD also has been approved as a drug by GW Pharma, the manufacturers were GW Pharma, but once it's approved as a drug, pure CBD now technically is no longer a supplement or doesn't fit into any category except the drug category. So if you're making a CBD claim of pure CBD in your product, um, technically you're violating, um, the FDA could come in and say you're, it's an illegal product and an unapproved drug. So recent, I mean, it seems like every week there's new regulations, they're changing, evolving, you know, some for the good, some for the bad. In this case, in 2021, USDA, this is mainly for the growers, they changed a couple of things that allowed um, more time and more leeway. So one thing was they gave the sample collection agents had a 30 day window to collect samples for compliance. They raised the negligent violation from 0.5% THC to 1% THC, which helps because, you know, plants, they don't always adhere to like pharmaceuticals. If you've got them growing in one area outside that has a little more sunlight or something, it may have higher THC than the ones that are in another area. So it becomes very difficult for hemp farmers, you know, to comply when Initially, you know, they just have the 0.5. So it was raised to 1%, which I think is, is fairly reasonable at this point. And then they were telling people that they had to test in DEA registered labs right away, but that got pushed, bumped up to 2022. And they allow FDA different types of labs and qualifications. Recent regulations in California, the AB 45 proposition passed in October. And this finally gave, at least in California, hemp products to be able to be legally put into statewide, into beverages, dietary supplements, cosmetics, and pet food. But again, you know, it has to meet that 0.3% or less THC level. And what they did, I think is brilliant that other states have not yet done, is they defined it as the what THC is. And one of the key things is, as you see on the second bullet point, Delta 8 THC is under this being THC, you know, in that 0.3% or less. What has happened is a lot of companies have found a loophole and have been marketing Delta 8 THC as being from hemp and thus for, therefore being supposedly legal, you know, not as marijuana, but it is in large quantities. And what they are doing is they're taking the CBD from the hemp plant and they're synthesizing the Delta-8 THC from that, which is psychoactive. And some states like California have realized this and already banned this, but Florida and a couple of other states still are allowing this, which to me is, is not good because there's a lot of safety issues in this synthesis process that we're just starting to look at. I just got back from a conference in Mississippi and FDA was presenting data and several other people about Delta-8 THC and how there's been um, liver, um, <laughs> liver issues, um, deaths, everything surrounding this Delta-8. So um, it's nice, at least in Canada, Canada and more 
states hopefully will get on the bandwagon. Um, so in the industry, chromatography has been the benchmark, you know, test method for everything from pharmaceuticals, supplements, environmental labs, you name every industry, they've got an HPLC in there. It's been around a long time. It's been used for obviously qualifying incoming raw materials and finished products for research and most of the regulatory methods are centered around chromatography. So here comes Aqualog. Why is this fascinating? Well, this was fascinating to me because there was a lot of issues I saw with HPLC or a lot of complaints when I worked for a column manufacturer. Um, they were complaining about the time, the cost of the consumables, the reference standards. You know, they would always revert to if there was a cheaper method, they'd want to do it. But most of the cheaper methods usually meant sacrificing specificity so people could easily fool those methods and allow adulteration to enter. So a team intrigued me, which um, the next speaker will tell you all the details. But what I liked about it is the speed of analysis. The initial cost is basically the same as your basic HPLC, but you're not paying for those contracts, you know, that you have to for all the maintenance you must do. The consumables are gone, you know, basically you're just cuvettes. And of course, it's environmentally you know, very good for you because you're just using those little cuvettes. So potential end users, you know, it, it seems like every industry can benefit from this technology as far as I'm concerned and what I've seen. I'm a consultant for this company, just so you know, I don't get paid for this. Um, but I just saw a huge, great um, benefit, you know, for this. And, you know, the contract testing labs, you know, if you send anything, anything out, they're expensive. The turnaround time is, is, you know, it could be a week or more, and the cost of it is, is crazy. So with that, I'll let Adam go on, and I thank you for your time and would love to entertain any questions you might have later. So thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to uh, be here today. Um, of course, it's uh, good to pick up where Yana left me off here. So. As she explained, uh, the major sort of market that we've uh, encountered and, and uh, addressed with the Aqualog and the A-Team has to do with quality assurance and quality control. Um, and you know, we provide a lot of advantages, as she explained, in terms of simplifying sample extraction, concentration, and cleanup, column and pump maintenance, and things of this nature associated with liquid and gas chromatography. Um, but mostly we've simplified the instrument uh, operation to make it um, facile for, you know, the standard lab operator. So what we're going to be talking about today is just a little bit more uh, our jargon here, what we call the A-team. This is actually short for the absorption, transmittance, fluorescence, excitation, emission spectroscopy. So I'll uh, walk you through this a little bit more. But Again, the main advantages are speed, uh, seconds to minutes acquisition, very robust analysis uh, toolboxes for um, applying some of the uh, more advanced machine learning principles that are coming onto the market. Um, and we provide excellent inter and interlaboratory performance. Uh, we've just recently completed uh, an ASTM method for the water industry uh, as evidence for uh, the relative performance of the system. So it's known as column-free chromatography or what we call optical chromatography. So again, we'll tell you a little bit more here. So the optical bench is really a, a patented uh, system. So we're combining UV vis absorption and fluorescence spectroscopy. Now, uh, for the sake of this presentation, I think the main thing to keep in mind is that um, we're analyzing samples in a cuvette here, which you see in the center of our, uh, what we call sample compartment. And we measure the light as it transmits through the cell for the absorption and to get higher sensitivity and avoid the noise associated with the light source that's common for UV vis and other types of spectroscopy. We measure the fluorescence at a right angle and we can collect the complete fully corrected absorption and fluorescence spectra 
uh, for every excitation and absorption wavelength. So we call this again A team, and we just want to highlight some of you know the real synergy of having these two uh, measurements uh, made orthogonally. So again, we're measuring the absorption, which as everybody knows, measures colored compounds. So this is anything that you can see uh, in the visible range, but also things that are in the infrared beyond the human vision and into the ultraviolet. We can transform the absorption information and data into a transmittance spectra, which we can also then use to acquire and evaluate true color CIE, uh, LAB, and chromaticity information. But the most important uh, aspect of the technique is this EAM, which we call the excitation emission matrix. So as we collect the absorbance information scanning from the red to the UV, at every absorption wavelength, we collect the complete fluorescence uh, emission spectra. And it's this fluorescence emission spectra that has information on all fluorescent compounds. So the colored species, light scattering, and many things are measured with the absorption part of the spectrum, but we also have uh, any fluorescent compounds, so we can potentially you know, measure dozens of compounds simultaneously by identifying them through this excitation emission matrix. But the most important aspect of this and the uh, real patented sort of feature for this methodology is the correction of what we call inner filter effects. So previously, the use of fluorescence for analytical spectroscopy has really been held back by the fact that um, when you're measuring fluorescence, uh, the light as it's transferring you know, through the cell for the absorption path and leaving the measuring cell for the fluorescence path is, is absorbed. And we can correct for that on the fly you know, uh, as we're you know, acquiring the data simultaneously. So this allows us to have higher sensitivity. We can work with up to higher concentration ranges. But most importantly, it means that we can collect spectra that represents pure chemical species and allow us to build libraries of these uh, data, these chemical spectra and build databases, uh, which is basically the essence of, of the A-team methodology. So again, just to highlight the synergy, uh, I get asked this question all the time. The people say, these absorption and fluorescence spectra look very similar, they overlap. How can you tell the difference? And one of the things I like to point out is that this is really a truly five-dimensional optical chromatography method. So as you're familiar with high school chemistry, the concentration of a compound uh, is unique for a given solvent condition. And that is associated with what we call the extinction coefficient. And any chemical will have a unique absorption spectrum, you know, defined by its molecular structure, as well as a, a fairly unique extinction coefficient associated with the, you know, solvent interaction. But if it's also fluorescent, then there's another relationship between the concentration and the absorption known as the fluorescence quantum efficiency. So this quantum efficiency and the extinction coefficient are two physical constants that almost no two molecules will share the same value. So that's one of the leveraging points statistically, but we also have the unique fluorescence excitation and emission spectra for each compound. And again, this gives us the unique access to um, simultaneously evaluate overlapping and similar uh, compounds with similar spectra. Now, another key thing about the instrument is that it's completely uh, calibrated and certified to the latest U.S. Pharmacopeia um, chapter guidelines for all aspects of absorption and fluorescence, uh, wavelength accuracy, stray light, the uh, signal to noise, and, and things of this nature. So it's it's uh, very well suited now for these quality control applications and in, in almost any laboratory that requires these types of um, regulations. Now, as Jana pointed out, the chromatographies, gas chromatography, liquid chromatography are sort of the go-to methods for high accuracy, high sensitivity. The main, you know, hold back for these types of methods is that they're very expensive. They're also very, you know, relatively slow. They're not compatible with what we call real-time process monitoring, they're very expensive. 
Uh, there are also other optical techniques that are used for similar you know, uh, types of um, evaluations of different chemistries, such as Raman and uh, Fourier transfer and infrared and UV vis. But these are also um, much less sensitive in terms of the molecular concentrations that you need to, to have. Uh, so these are you know, either scattering or absorbance techniques or reflectance techniques. So the A team being a purely optical technique uh, where we collect the data under Beer Lambert linear conditions in a you know solvent with generally using a flow cell um, has much higher sensitivity. Uh, so again we can do you know many different types of chemicals in the same analysis uh, very rapidly. So this affords us real-time capabilities for potential online app line uh, process monitoring as well as just quality you know assurance and quality control measurements at the bench top level. Now the majority, to get to the subject of, of hemp and cannabis, I'm going to first sort of advertise a paper that we've just recently had accepted in uh, cannabis and cannabinoid research. And this is sort of the basis of uh, explaining our primary methodology as it's applied to various what we call strains or cultivars of cannabis sativa, and as these are, you know, basically associated with uh, the genetics of the uh, University of Mississippi Laboratory, the El Soli Laboratory, which is our main uh, collaborator for this publication. So everybody's very familiar with cannabis. There are various natural um, cultivars, uh, sativa, indica, and ruderalis um, that grow, you know, they're basically associated with different geographical regions. Um, so cannabis sativa and indica are probably the most you know, famous commercially uh, in the legal hemp market. But one thing I wanted to point out is that there's also a differentiation, as um, Jana pointed out, between what we call hemp, and what we call illegal marijuana, that's based on this 0.3% total THC rule. So the cannabinoid pathway here um, is essential to uh, that particular regulation. So there's a parent compound called CBGA, and there are enzymes, uh, the THCA synthase and the CBDA synthase, that generate the acid forms of THC delta 9 and CBD. And so CBD, the acid form is the, and THCA are the predominant forms in the natural uh, plant as it's growing and immediately harvested, and it requires heat to what we call decarboxylate um, the acid form to the neutral form, which are the psychoactive form of delta 9 THC and the pharmaceutical, uh, you know, most common product, the neutral form of CBD. There are also oxidation reactions that are associated with breakdown of the THC compounds into what we call CBN and um, delta 8 THC. It's a sort of an isomerization reaction. Now again, um, we're first evaluated with the uh, research that we did at the University of Mississippi. Uh, they're purified standards. So of course they've isolated pure chemical standards. And what we're looking at here in the blue and the green are the acid forms of CBD and THCA. Uh, these are what we call the excitation spectra. So these are related to the absorption profiles. And these are all normalized to the same maximum. And then we have our neutral forms of THC and CBD in red and black. Now, of course, you're looking at these and you're saying, well, of course, these are very similar, but these are all normalized and don't take into consideration the natural variation and the extinction coefficients and the fluorescent quantum yields. But Still, you can see there are significant differences in the peak widths and the band shapes that are associated with these. And when we look at the fluorescence emission spectra for these, again, you see even larger differences in the normalized spectra. So the red being CBD, the black being THCA, uh, changes in the center wavelengths and the um, peak uh, widths, and also for the, the acid, acid forms. So again, any difference that you can see by eye, of course, statistically is extremely significant because this is a two-dimensional sort of extrapolation uh, interpretation of this 3D data. And the 3D data set has thousands and thousands of data points. So it's, it's almost impossible to make mistake one um, cannabinoid for another. 
So we analyzed the three different uh, varieties of um, marijuana that were uh, basically genetically um, isolated at the University of Mississippi. There are three types. One that's HCBD that has extremely high CBDA synthase. Another one at the bottom, which is high THC that has very high THCA synthase and then various intermediates of those. Now you can immediately see just by eye that there are significant differences in these 3D EAM contours. And of course, when we profile them, now you get a sort of a view of how significant the extinction coefficients and the quantum efficiencies are. So there's a lot of this other dimension of the uh, technique comes into play. And what it all boils down to is that we can make absolutely 100% certainty whether the plant is high THC shown here in the green, whether it's some intermediate shown in the blue, or if it's in the red, it's the legal CBD variety. So this is a method that you can use to just very rapidly and certainly determine uh, the basis of the cultivar with respect to the expression of CBD versus THC. And we have an automated uh, analysis program that takes this basically further. Well, anyway, there is an automated uh, analysis platform that allows us to present the um, information automatically. So we can automatically apply the models and you analyze the sample and just seconds later you can get a printed uh, report answer that it basically tells you. So simply uh, you scroll for the uh, browse for the, the data information in the user interface and uh, find the data file and generate the report. And we have several um, recordings and uh, demonstrations of that available if you have interest after this uh, presentation. My apologies. Um, but more importantly, of course, being able to differentiate marijuana from hemp uh, is the key issue here. And so we can make a classification where we simply say we've identified this, uh, but if you have the, the need to make a quantitative evaluation, because we can individually uh, measure each of these major cannabinoids, CBD and acid and neutral THC with very high um, regression coefficients, uh, we can actually predict well below the 0.1% um, target limit let me go back to my laser pointer here. So the most methodologies, including the HPLC that you see here, uh, are generally uh, around 0.05 to 0.02, which is roughly in the same region that we have for identifying THCA. And if you were to expand this lower plot of total THC uh, to include 0.3%, basically all points, just as you saw in that uh, principal components analysis diagram will be contained and positively identified as being uh, legal hemp varieties. Now, of course, there's more information that many, you know, hemp manufacturers are interested in. Uh, there's what we call the total sort of potency profile. So the University of Mississippi has developed HPLC and gas chromatography methods uh, that they've calibrated for you know, all of these compounds, so the acid neutral forms, THC, CBD, uh, the um, delta-9 and delta-8 THCs, and many, many minor cannabinoids, as we mentioned before, including CBN, the decomposition product of the THCs. And this is like sort of the overall distribution. So if we look at all the samples that we've tested, and these are natural product flower extracts, of course, you see that uh, the amount of the acid forms predominates, the, the um, neutral forms are more minor, and of course then you have even more minor expression of many, many other cannabinoids that are sort of listed here in the legend. And so if we do a principal components analysis of, say, the pure chemical standards for each of those materials, and we've actually applied here uh, a 95% competence interval that's significantly smaller than the symbol sizes that I'm showing here for these four repeats. So each of these is multiple repeats of the same uh, standard that's identified here in the legend. And you can see that there's basically no, um, like I said, complete resolution of each of these pure standard compounds. 
Now, when we analyze these again quantitatively, um, we report here the sort of regression statistics in terms of detection limits, what we call LOD, the R squareds, the limits of quantification, um, our average for the residual to the line, and what we call the standard deviation, which is really the root mean square error of the prediction. So when we predict the line, um, if you were to take any point, it's sort of the, the confidence interval, the standard deviation relative to that line. And we've separated these cannabinoids fairly similarly to the um, pie chart that I showed earlier. So we have our major cannabinoids that make up to 0.45% of the total cannabinoid distribution throughout the sample set. Then there's a, sort of an intermediate level of cannabinoids around 0.3 to 0.2%. Then there are cannabinoids that exist around you know, below 0.1%. And this includes uh, you know, several compounds that you may have heard of. And of course, delta-8 and delta-9 are up in the, the major cannabinoid region. And one of the things that we wanted to point out about these numbers is that these numbers actually relate to the effective sample-to-sample uh, -sample, um, repeatability from the raw product all the way through the extraction and chromatographic process and then as we calibrate them with the A-team. So what you'll notice, of course, higher concentration compounds have relatively higher R-squares with errors of prediction that are better than 1%. And then we get down to the intermediate levels and the prediction errors uh, propagate to around 2%. And then when we get down to the lower concentrations, we get slightly below 2% on average, which is a natural phenomenon if you know the concentration is lower then the absolute amount of error is going to be, you know, the relative error and prediction are going to go down. So again, this is a, um, just evidence that with raw material, we can screen for whether it's cannabis or whether it's hemp or whether it's an intermediate. We can make, you know, legally uh, valid Delta-9 and THCA evaluations, whether it's legal hemp or CBD containing uh, legal material. So this brings us to the topic of that will be coming up next in terms of the particle size application, but we've worked with the same companies. And what we're looking at is called uh, emulsification. So cannabinoids are all what we call hydrophobic materials. So they are not soluble in water uh, readily. So in order to prepare them for consumption, uh, whether it's going to be a food or a liquid product or a gummy bear or something like that, they have to be emulsified. So this means you disperse them, and uh, typically this dispersion in involves sort of a mechanical process where you first dissolve them in oil, they're lipophilic types of compounds, and you ultrasonicate them to render what we call a nanoparticulate dispersal or nano emulsification. And there are various types of CBD and THC emulsions. Uh, we have our full spectrum emulsion, which contains everything, but may not, in terms of CBD, have any THC, only minor amounts. We have a broad spectrum uh, that basically doesn't have any THC. And most commonly, uh, we have a CBD isolate where they've purified the CBD uh, and then emulsified it, which is generally the most common and the type of material that we've analyzed with the A-team. And there's also the question, you know, as I talked before, the, the difference between the acid form and the neutral form of CBD. Uh, the neutral form is basically more stable. It's believed that pharmacology, the interaction with the human body of the CBD acid neutral forms is slightly different. CBDA is not believed to bind to the same cannabinoid receptors as uh, CBD and THC. So that's one thing to kind of keep in mind. And what we're looking at here are EAM spectra of a 3% emulsion, another 3% emulsion, and a 7.5% emulsion. So you can see that the purified spectra over this concentration range, the only thing that's changing is really the intensity. And then, then we can make extremely precise uh, measurements of the actual concentrations of these materials and compare those to other HPLC um, evaluations. So the lower three materials that I just showed uh, one is, a, um, they're both designed for beverages, then we have our topical uh, 
application that's at a higher concentration. So we're you know significantly better than you know one percent in terms of precision. So with that, I concluded, of course, that you know with the A team we could discriminate different cannabis varieties based on the cannabinoid content. Uh, we can quantify the total THC, you know, significantly below the 0.1% sort of requirement for that application. Um, on top of that, we can provide a very comprehensive potency profile with 14 different cannabinoids at this point. And then we can also, of course, measure cannabinoid purity with these emulsified types of preparations. And I wanted to point out that these emulsifications are a product that uh, are part of our collaboration with H Squares Industries, and we're very uh, thankful to them for providing those materials and being sort of a sponsor for this seminar. I also want to point out there's a number of other potential applications for this technology. Um, many of these cannabinoids are purified through distillation processes, so of course we can easily uh, follow those types of purifications, um, generally through a, a vacuum steam distillation. Uh, we can also do monitor decarboxylation. As we mentioned before, CBDA is the major natural form. So many, uh, you know, before they do the CBD isolate, there's a decarboxylation. We can also monitor isomerization, differentiate delta-9 and delta-8 THC, which is another sort of upcoming process that's going on. And of course, we can monitor stability and storage aspects and several other things. And of course, you know, the most important thing is that this can now be facilitated with our auto sampling and operator level analysis software packages for reporting the regression, which is sort of the concentration information, or just making a yes or no discrimination sort of decision. And with that, I'll happily pass the torch to my colleague, uh, Sean Travers, who will be telling you a lot more about particle size and emulsification of CBD. So um, the best place to start is usually at the beginning. So what is the definition of an emulsion? As Adam kind of alluded to, an emulsion is a mixture of minute droplets of one liquid, which is not soluble in another. Um, typically, they, com they are composed of two components that do not mix, plus an emulsifying agent that brings them together. And uh, a pretty good example of this is at right. You can see mayonnaise without an emulsifying agent. Yes, there is that much oil in mayonnaise and mayonnaise with an emulsifying agent. So it makes a pretty big difference in food products. So uh, there are two types. You're, when you're dispersing oil in water and also inverse emulsions where you're dispersing water in oil. So the type that we're looking at is oil and water for CBD. Um, there are quite a few forms of these that are prevalent right now and they are sodas, beverages, medications, uh, condiments, cosmetics, and creams, and probably the simplest example that everyone is familiar with is salad dressing, right? You have an oil and a vinegar and a salad dressing. You shake it up to kind of get them to mix. You pour it out on your salad, and then you set it back, and the next time you go to use it, it's completely separated out again. So this would be referred to as a temporary emulsion. It's not something that's stable long term. So for CBD products, we require something a bit more consistent. So I figured I'd change to a little bit more appetizing picture so we're not looking at separated mayonnaise all day, but um, these beverages and creams are permanent emulsions or they like to think that they are, it's how they're referred to. They're oil and water plus a surfactant agent and emulsifier. Most of these agents have a lipophilic end and a hydrophilic end, meaning one side likes being dissolved in water and one side likes being in oil. There are natural emulsifiers, and one of the ones that I've come across pretty consistently in my work in the beverage industry is gum arabic. It's a very good emulsifying agent, and it also has a good mouthfeel, and the people that work with sodas will understand what I'm referring to there. So. All emulsions are going to destabilize over time. You could think of these dispersions as just particles in water, right? So they're all moving in solution constantly, and as they collide with each other, they grow to larger and larger sizes. So the smaller the particles are in your emulsion, the more time it's going to take for it to break down. So smaller particles and a lack of large particles are going to give you long-term stability for an emulsion. So, since we are interested in CBD oil being dispersed in water and its stability over time, there are a few factors that we need to consider when looking at this. 
The first one is what Adam talked about first, and that is the quantity of oil and the components in the mixture is going to have an effect. And Adam showed that we can monitor that quite nicely with uh, fluorescence and via the aqualog. However, stability of these emulsions is strongly influenced by particle size, and that is through uh, DLS is one of the techniques we'll talk about, and that's the SZ100, and also laser diffraction, which is the LA960. Now, particle size is not typically a simple measurement, but it's meant to be displayed as a distribution. And what we can see down here are two examples of emulsions. One, this first one, the green unprocessed, is just where all the ingredients are put together and then it's kind of shaken. But as Adam alluded to, there are things like high shear homogenizers that are designed for this that will take these ingredients and process them down into much smaller sizes and give you a monomeric distribution. So instead of this being bimodal, like here, it's now mono dispersed. There's one major peak with no larger peaks. Um, the best emulsions are typically measured that way in nanometer size ranges and with a mono dispersed peak. I'm also gonna talk about zeta potential, which is a bit more difficult subject. I don't really have time to get into that in depth, but essentially that is a measurement of the surface charge on particles. And the larger that surface charge is, the less likely your particles are to interact. So I'll touch on those as we go. This slide just kind of gives you an idea of different applications and size ranges and the methods that fit them. So today we're gonna to be talking about laser diffraction and DLS, so the SD100 and the LA960. So first, uh, what is DLS? DLS is dynamic light scattering and it refers to the measurement and interpretation of data on a millisecond, microsecond time scale. And essentially we're using a laser and shining it through a cuvette and looking at particles that are suspended and watching their Brownian motion to measure size. So DLS can be used to measure particle size and size distribution, as I've alluded to already. These are reported as the hydrodynamic size of the particles that we're looking at and also, also zeta potential. So uh, the results from the SC100 are typically given as the average hydrodynamic size, as I alluded to. And one of its strong features is you can use a very small amount of sample. Typically we're using a cuvette that holds one to five milliliters, but we do have accessories that can get down to about 10 microliters. However, the upper limit of the SC100 is about five to 10 microns. It depends a bit on your application. But um, this can be a bit of a problem as large aggregations can be missed. And I'll show you some examples of this uh, down the line. So with emulsions, typically you're going to want to do a study over time of how stable they are. And typically that means you make a bunch of them and you set them on a shelf and you watch them to see how long it takes them to start to break apart. And typically you're going to want to measure particle sizes that are going to get larger than that micron barrier. So if you expect particles that are larger than a micron, you should probably use laser diffraction instead. So to give you an idea of how we're taking our measurements, we have a light source and a laser, and we're shining that through a cuvette where these particles are suspended. We're measuring it about 90 degree off, but we can also measure backscatter as well. And as I mentioned, we need about one to five milliliters, but we can go down to about 10 microliters of volume necessary for these measurements. And the range that we're looking at is gets down pretty low. So we're looking at single digit nanometer ranges up to about 10 microns. So the next technique that I'm going to talk about is laser diffraction. And this is the LA960. So um, laser diffraction is looking at diffraction patterns of a laser passed through an object and about basically using that to calculate size from nanometers all the way up to millimeters. So this gives you a wider size range to examine. It is incredibly fast and precise. It is a much quicker measurement than uh, the SZ100, probably about 10 times so. And uh, it's very easy to use. It has a large install base and Fariba has a litany of instructional videos for both using the instrumentation and how to interpret your data, which is actually the much more tricky part of particle size. So LA960 can measure solids. So we have a solid accessory here. You put your powder in here and there's a vibratory funnel. So it kind of shakes your sample down and it's gonna drop down through the measurement range. And the laser is coming across this way to measure your particle size. 
we can also measure liquids. You would take a liquid, and if you open this up, there is a reservoir in there. You would drip your liquid into there, and then we would it recycles through an area through here, and we take the measurement. We also have the ability to directly measure emulsions and pastes. So you could take a cream and smear it on a glass slide and then press it together, similar to how you would prepare a microscope slide, and then take measurements that way. And as I mentioned, this technique really gives you wide ranging results that let you see larger particles that can be useful for stability studies. So this is the accessory that we use to take these measurements. This is called a fraction cell. You can use this or a litany of our other accessories. They sit in on a tray inside the instrument. You pull this forward or back and they drop and lock into place. The laser light is gonna come from this side and we will see, a, it'll schedule, we'll get a diffraction pattern and then we'll have a whole bunch of detectors arrayed around this side to interpret that signal that we're getting. Uh, this, the volume that we need for these measurements tends to be a little bit larger. It goes five to 15 milliliters and the size range that we get goes down to about 10 nanometers up to about three millimeters. So you can see much larger particles in this fashion. So why are we interested in particle size and zeta potential? So this picture at the right shows microscopy of an emulsion. So particle size is gonna directly correlate to the stability of your emulsion. You'll notice here that we have small particles, medium sized particles and larger sized particles. So as I mentioned before, the more often these particles collide, they're gonna start growing. So the presence of large particles is gonna give you less stability. So the best emulsions are gonna be mono dispersed, meaning there's only one major size range and they're going to be smaller. In addition, uh, zeta potential, which we can measure with the SZ100, will also increase stability. It doesn't matter whether the charge you're looking at is positive or negative, what matters is the magnitude of that charge. The larger the surface charge is, and that's what we're looking at with zeta potential, the more likely these two particles are to repel from each other. Remember, opposite charges attract and like charges repel. So the larger the surface charge is on these two particles, the more likely they are to push each other away and not come together. So uh, these are the instruments that I've talked about. Here is the LA960, and here is the SZ100. And as Adam kind of alluded to, there are techniques to increase emulsion stability. And this is one example. This is a microfluidizer, which is a very high shear homogenizer, which is excellent at both rupturing cells and decreasing emulsion sizes. So here we're seeing unprocessed ingredients, just kind of mixed together, maybe shaken. You take a particle size, you see there's very large particles, and then they kind of dwindle down into the, about the one micron range. You put it through this high shear homogenizer, the particle size shifts smaller, and you start to see these larger particles disappear. You put it through five times, and you see a mono dispersed peak all the way down to about 91 nanometers and you see the disappearance of these larger particles. So this emulsion in green would be much more stable than just a single pass or the two passes or the unprocessed emulsion that we took measurements of previously. Um, one of the things that we're also asked to investigate fairly often is the effect of pH on CBD droplet size. So these lines are just gonna represent particle size in these diagrams. They're D10, D50, and D90, and that just simply means 10% of our particles are less than D10, 50% are smaller than D50, and so on for D90. So this particular emulsion, which came from our colleagues at H squared, we looked at was stable across pretty wide pH ranges. So from about three nanometers all the way up to 10, the uh, size range really was not affected. However, in the second sample that we were sent, you can see that the, part, the, the particle size was stable from about six up to 11. And once we dip below to five or lower, there, we started to see some perturbations in the particle size. And then once we got to really acidic conditions below two, it really started to break down. So in this example, I wanna show a stable versus an unstable emulsion. And again, these samples came from the same place. Um, we're looking at a 10% CBD emulsion at a pH of around six for these two samples. 
you can see these are mono dispersed. There's one major peak and no large tail. So these would be pretty stable emulsions. However, if we take these same emulsions and put the pH down to about 2.5 or so, and then take these measurements again, you can see that we still have a peak that's around the same size, but you start to see these larger particles come in. And these are about, I'd say five microns to 10 microns. So you might be able to see these with the SE100, but you would definitely miss these larger particles as you're moving from 10 microns to 100. So this blue line just kind of gives you an idea of the size cutoff between the SC100, which would be this range, and the 960 in this range. So if you're looking at emulsion stability over time and you want to see these larger particles, the LA960 in this case would be a better choice. So uh, lastly, I have time to quickly touch on zeta potential, which is a really difficult technique to explain and thoroughly understand. But basically, if we take a negatively charged particle and you put it in solution, positive ions are going to associate around this in the first layer. And then the second layer outside of that, this is showing you as far as the sphere of influence goes for this particle. So what we're taking in the measurement of zeta potential is the cumulative charge from the surface of the particle to as far as that charge affects out in the solution. And looking at that charge, again, as I mentioned, whether it's positive or negative is irrelevant. The magnitude of the charge is what is important. So again, particles are growing when they collide, but a larger, larger charge, a zeta potential, makes them more likely to repel each other than collide and gives you a more stable emulsion. And just to quickly go through some data, we're looking at three different measurements here. This emulsion was around 27 nanometers, and you can see it has a larger zeta potential. And these two were pretty close, around 56 nanometers, and they have a little bit less zeta potential. So this holds true in a lot of cases, but the more zeta potential you have, the more likely you are to have a stable emulsion. So I think that is about all the time that we have allotted for today. So I just want to wrap things up with some including comments I put together from myself and my colleagues. So careful monitoring of emulsions is crucial to the burgeoning CBD market for a lot of purposes, mainly legal purposes, so you're not getting in trouble. Quantification of cannabinoids and particle size analysis are crucial to quality control of your products. And Hariba offers a suite of products to help you with these that are complementary to each other. As Adam talked about eloquently, um, Aqualog with 18 fluorescence is gonna give you the ability to quantify your oil components, keeping track of CBD and THC components in a single cuvette measurement. The particle size techniques that I talked about, the SC100 and the 960 are also great tools for measuring and analyzing particle size. So these are complementary techniques that both are important to interrogating how stable your final product is. The SC100 is gonna go from low nanometer range up to about five microns, lets you use a very small sample size and also measures zeta potential. However, if you're more interested in just stability and measuring different types of, of samples, solid liquids and pastes, and going from the nanometer range up to the millimeter range and looking at the stability of your emulsions, the LA960 is probably the better choice. So taken together, these Hariba tools present an excellent suite of products to monitor the quality, quality control of your emulsions and to quantify the components of interest for the natural products market. I just wanna take a second to thank all of our collaborators who gave us data and helped us with putting these projects together. And thank you all for attending. And I think we are ready to take any questions. Thank you, Sean, Adam, and Yana for that excellent talk. Okay, so in the interest of time, let me quickly jump into it. This person asked, and I think this question is for Sean. Sean, I'm working with nano emulsion in beverages. Which technique would you recommend to look at the droplets? Uh, in the nano range, uh, depends which region are. Um, if you're in the very low nanometer range, which I would find surprising, uh, if you're down to like single digit nanometers, that would be an impressive emulsion. But if you're into the 100 nanometer range, either technique is would work fairly well. But I would probably lean towards the LA960 because it gives you that wider dispersion 
or and let you see across a larger radius. So the, in the example that I gave, you would miss, if you looked at those two samples, one with the 960 and one with the SE100, you would miss that larger tail and you would assume that that's still a pretty stable emulsion when you're dropping the pH. Mm. So the LA960 would give you a larger view of making sure that you have a mono dispersed emulsion. Both would work well, but I would probably lean towards the 960. Thank you. The next question is for Adam. Adam, what is the common measurement time for A team per sample? Um, about 45 seconds for the samples that I showed, or you know, around 45 seconds Thank for all you. the samples I showed. Oh, that's pretty fast. Cool. Uh, the next question, can can you comment on how the aqua law can control for any scatter from the particles in the fluorescence um, or spectra absorption? Oh, that's a very good point. So the aqua log has actually been, uh, was designed with what we call a subtractive double grading excitation monochromator. So all of the light that um, passes through the sample cell has been purified through two monochromators. So the second monochromator um, actually reverses the uh, diffraction of light. So the light that's emitted by the monochromator um, is the same color from on both sides of what we call the slit. So we were basically emitting highly purified color. So the scattering properties and the ability to deal with turbid solutions is actually optimized with the use of this double grading monochromator so we could deal with uh, very turbid and, and scattering uh, sample solutions. Thank you. Okay, so I want to point out that if you have more questions um, or if other questions were to come up later on, you are welcome to um, email us at labinfo at hariba.com. Okay, is there anything else that you would like to add, Yana, Adam, or Sean, before we wrap up? Well, I'd just like to thank everybody. I think that those are excellent questions. And uh, I think, you know, if, of course, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me personally at my uh, personal email. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Same here. Thank you for your time. And we look forward to hearing from you. Um, on behalf of our group, thank you so much for attending. And we'll see you at our next webinar. Don't miss it. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.